Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come here to Kingsburg. And I just ask that you send your Holy Spirit to speak your words through me tonight as we discuss this very intricate topic of worship. And Lord, be with each and every person in this room as um, they are maybe hearing this for the very first time. And um, just speak your words to them that you want to use me as your tool. I love you, Lord. Amen. So let me ask a question. Why do we worship? You ever sat there and thought about that? Why why do we all have this deep desire and this deep need to worship something, somebody? God put that in each and every one of us. We know that the entire war in heaven started because of worship. We know that as the end of the world draws near, the end struggle will be over worship. So it's an extremely important topic to understand. What is worship? Is there a right way to worship? Is there a wrong way to worship? If you look at Matthew 4.10, this is Christ speaking to Satan himself when he came down to tempt him. And then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So coming out of the mouth of Jesus himself, he is saying that God is the only one that we should be worshiping. And also Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, he says, But the hour cometh and now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him, for God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So what this is telling me is that there is a right way to worship God, and there is a wrong way to worship God. Satan has has been trying to manipulate our forms of worship. But what does it mean that spirit, that non-physical part of our human characteristics, our emotions, the soul, You see, what is the only thing that you're taking to heaven with you? Does anybody know? Your character. And it's made up of two things. Do you know what two things your character is actually made up of? Your thoughts and your feelings. That's it. Your thoughts and your feelings. And what do movies mess with? Your thoughts and your feelings. So, it's really important to understand in this whole realm of worship, we're dealing with our, our characteristics, our souls. If you look at, at Cain and Abel here, Cain thought he was worshiping God. Remember, he built the altar to worship God, but he said, God, I'm going to actually worship you in my own way. I'm going to put my fruits and vegetables in the labors that I have because I want to worship you like this. And what was the result of that? God was displeased with his form of worship, and Cain became angry and murdered his brother Abel. If you look at the children of Israel, when they came out of, the, out of, the, um, out of Egypt, and they were so in need of worshiping something, and here Moses had gone up into the mountain, and he had been away from them for not even 30 days, and God had done all these amazing things for them, and they had this need to just worship something. They begged Aaron, they said, give us something to worship. So here they they built this this calf and entered into a false system of worship. And when Moses came down, he broke the Ten Commandments. And and as a result, a lot of Israelites fell into that apostasy. Balaam and, and his donkey, if you remember what happened right at this story, remember, the Israelites had been traveling around for 40 years, wandering in the wilderness. And they had just come out of the wilderness. And they were standing in between the promised land or at the River Jordan. And they were looking into this land that they had been promised, their forefathers had been promised that it would be theirs. And all the other nations that were on the other side of the land of Canaan, they've heard the stories. They knew that when they came out of the land of Egypt that God had completely annihilated the Egyptians to give them the ability to leave. So they knew that the, there was this mighty, mighty people that were going to come to their promised land and take it. So the Midianite kings, they were the ones that came to Balaam. They knew that Balaam was, was, um, was a prophet. And they said, look, 
We are so scared. We don't know what to do. We know that we have no power over these people. Why don't you come and curse them? Because we know who you curse is going to get cursed, and we know who you bless is going to get blessed. And if you remember, Balaam, with his whole donkey that talked to him, he couldn't curse the Israelites. He ended up blessing them three times. And so, as a result of that, um, the Midianite kings were just like, there's, nothing, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. So they came up to, 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 to Balaam and they just said, please, please tell us something. And Balaam said, I'll tell you what, if you want to beat the Israelites, as long as they're following their God, you cannot touch them. You can't do anything to them. But if you want to get them to fall out of the favor of God, all you need to do is make a festival, throw some parties, and invite the Israelites to come to your parties and let them just witness how you worship your gods. And Israel will fall prey to spiritual idolatry and they will fall out of favor of God and you will be able to beat them. So that's exactly what happened. At Balaam's request, they started sending their women into the camp so that, that it was just a few at a time, unnoticed. And before long, the women got all the men to come to their parties and a ton of Israelites fell up in the, into an apostasy. And as a result, a huge pestilence broke out and... God gave the order to annihilate anybody that was involved in this. So, a warning was issued. In Deuteronomy 12, 30 and 31, it says, And after they have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. So here, God is saying, look, don't even try to worship in this way. Because this is what happens. You will fall, fall away from true worship of God. And perhaps one of the most infamous stories of a false system of worship is Daniel and his three friends and Nebuchadnezzar's golden idol. Nebuchadnezzar got his idea for this idol from, this, from his dream. Here God had said, your kingdom will not stand. And he said, no, 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 my kingdom, of course, is going to stand. So he builds his idol completely out of gold in sheer arrogance, saying, the kingdom of Babylon will never fall. We will be victorious throughout the time. And hence, you can kind of see how we interpret these. Our artist interpretations are obviously having them stand, you know, in a very arrogant pose. We have many, many different systems of false worship set up today. But I would like to, sh to show you a system of false worship that we have today that has striking similarities to this story. What about this? Can you see this? Interesting. A golden idol. This is the Oscars, better known as the Academy Award or the Oscars. This is a highly, highly coveted thing in the film and television world. This is pretty much the cream of the crop, the tippy top. What does it mean to worship? Here is the dictionary definition. If you, I just got this from the Oxford American Dictionary. To treat someone or something with reverence or adoration appropriate to a deity. A deity is, of course, a god. And number two, an honor given to somebody in recognition of their merit. Now, aren't the Oscars giving somebody something in recognition of their merit? So by just a worldly definition here, this is a worship service. And in fact, they don't even call it just a service. What is it known as? It's known as a ceremony. Hmm. The Oscar event is the, typically the second most watched show each year, with almost 40 million people that watch the Academy Awards, and this is in 2007. I'm not too sure if this has even grown. Do you know what the number one most watched television show on the face of the planet is? Super Bowl. Do you know what just beat it? Michael Jackson. Just beat the Super Bowl by the most eyes watching on that around the world. Okay, Super Bowl is about 100 million. So this ceremony is a very, very, very highly watched thing in our world, okay? Now, what I'm going to show you here, this little golden idol that they have here, 
There's many different like ceremonies. They have one that honors music and one that honors television. Now I'm going to show you a clip that John Stewart and Stephen Colbert will tell you exactly what this golden idol is to them, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, our next two presenters have done for fake news what the Fox News Channel has done for fake news. Please welcome Stephen Colbert and John Stewart. Thank you. It's, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Good evening, godless sodomites. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? I'm bringing the truth, John. We're in Hollywood, the belly of the beast. You can't just, you can't just read the prompter? I'm reading the prompter in here. You can read that pablum. Award show banter is not pablum. Reality television celebrates the human condition. <laughs> by illuminating what's extraordinary in the ordinary person. It warps the minds of our children and weakens the resolve of our allies. The results are often dramatic and always unexpected. We're here to honor achievement in that category. By giving you a golden idol to worship. Kneel before your God, Babylon! During one of the most highly watched shows in the world. Kneel before your God, Babylon. And you know, they're obviously making a joke about it. Actors absolutely hate the reality world. It's taking a big chunk of their pie. But there's truth in every joke. It would not be funny if it wasn't, in a sense, true. So I started to look into this thing called the Oscars, right? Oscar, where the name comes from, is, it's Scandinavian and Old English. Could you take a wild guess what the word Oscar means? Divine strength, divine spear. So, divine, of course, is from, of, or, or like a god, and a spear, of course, is a weapon. Is it possible that they are using these high-profile celebrities as godlike weapons against us? Is that possible? In fact, does anybody know what this building is right here? Mm -hmm. No, but close. <laughs> This building is called the Shrine, and it is where the Oscars was held until 1999. Okay? The Shrine, the ceremony, all the linguos all there. The Shrine was founded by these two guys, William Florence and Walter Fleming. They are Scottish Rite Freemasons. Okay? High-ranking 33rd degree Freemasons. In fact, Hollywood has long time been involved in Masonic things. Here, Gene Autry, John Wayne, Nat King Cole, Duke Ellington, Cecile DeMille, Clark Cable, Walt Disney. These guys were all open, involved in the Masonic um, um, secret societies and things. For those of, the, of you out there that don't know what Freemasonry is, there's, it's, a, it's, it's a group, a club, so to say, of people. They call it a secret society. There's many different levels that you get involved in, you climb the ranks, and as you kind of complete the different tasks, you get farther and farther up the ladder. The first degrees, that goes all the way up to 33 degrees, the first few degrees are very community-oriented. They help people and everything. The tippy-top ones are the ones that are involved in running companies. They're hugely involved in occult practice things and, and generally what we barely know about it. There's a book called Morals and Dogma that Albert Pike wrote and in the book it says, uncover all the layers, we follow Lucifer, the light bearer. So the farther up you get, these guys know exactly what they're doing, okay? But this isn't a meeting trying to convince you about these secret societies. I just want to point something out to you that is fascinating about the Oscars, okay? Oh, yeah, these guys, too. Three of the most 
prominent guys from um, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, and, and Metro Golden Meyer, all 33rd degree Freemasons. This is called, if you guys can see this really well, this is called um, the picture on the right. Yes, you're right. It's called a Masonic tracing board. What it is, is a teaching tool that they use to teach the first, second, and third degree Freemasons that are coming into Freemasonry how to spot things that are Freemason. So they hide things in there. Notice there's a ladder. Notice there's a checkered floor. There's a sun that's beating, beaming uh, light onto a, a greater sun and everything. There's various different elements of sun worship that are in it. This is called the sun man right here. If you really peel back the layers and study it, they've incorporated lots of sun worship into their things, okay? So this model picture is for somebody that's involved in Freemasonry. We'll be able to look at it and go, this is Freemasonry, okay? This is inside of the shrine. This is what it looks like if you look at the ceiling. You can always pick pick out Freemasonry things because there's huge sun motifs in it. You see the sun motif in the ceiling? Here's kind of a little bit better of a picture of it. Now this is a clip where he won for the Life is Beautiful. Roberto! Does anybody remember this? One for Life is Beautiful. This is Italy's 26th nomination and its 10th Academy Award. Pause. This is in the shrine. This is in a Freemason building. This is the very last time that this has been held in this building till they moved it to the Kodak Theater, okay? This is a Masonic tracing board. Notice any similarities? Do you see the checkered floor? Do you see the archway? Do you see the sun? Do you see on the stage the sun beaming down onto an altar-looking thing? This is high-ranking Freemasonry that is literally stamping this, saying, we own this. This is us. So they moved to the Kodak Theater. This is the Kodak Theater right here. Notice the checkered floor. Notice the sun motif. It gets even more interesting. This right here on the left is called um, the Gate of Ishtar. It is the Gate to Babylon. This picture up here on the top is Isis and Horus. These are Egyptian gods. Peel back the layers. They are sun worship. So sun worship is very much incorporated. In fact, I, I used to live right, right near here in Hollywood. If you look through that middle tower where the, all those people are standing on there, my, my apartment building that I lived on was right there to the right. And I watched this whole thing being built. Worshipping the sun dates all the way back to Nimrod, all the way back to the start of Babylon. And what they used to believe is that when Nimrod died, he went up into the stars, and all of a sudden we have this born star worship. Well, it continues. What is worshipping stars, though? Where did this idea of star worship Start, Revelation 12, 4. And he drew a, th a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. Who drew a third part of the stars from heaven? Satan drew a third part of the stars from heaven and did cast them to earth. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. This idea of star worship originated with Satan wanting to be more infamous or more famous than God. And what has happened is now all these stars that have gained and wanted this desire for worship were all now cast down. And what do they do? They've just now changed the names and the things of star worship. 
people still worship the stars, just like they did all the way back. We have football stars, basketball stars, race car stars, hip hop stars, rock stars, movie stars. They're all stars. And do people worship these stars? Are people crazily worshiping these people? Even Kermit the Frog. Somebody who absolutely wasn't even alive on this planet. We've immortalized him and put him in stone. So, in 1 Timothy 4.1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This tells me some will depart from the faith. If they're going to depart from the faith, that means that they began with a faith. So how is it, how is it that us in a Christian environment or a Christian world, I was raised in a Christian home, and I went down to Hollywood and within months lost my religion. Months. It took me less than months probably. How was it that I was able to lose my way? I was obsessed with movies. I watched every kind of movie that was out there. I did not care what it was, who was in it. I watched tons of things followed after these stars. I went through the whole acting classes. I wanted to be an actor. I chased that dream for a very long time. Let me show you what I just found in Time Magazine online here. I thought this was just fascinating. Celebrity worship, is it good for your health? Who among us has fallen victim to a little bit of celebrity worship? And now new scientific research has found that celebrity crushes are not only common, but are, may even be healthy. A study published in September 10, 2008, suggests that the act of celebrity worship may be a boon to some people's self-esteem. Let me ask you a question. Ask all the little girls in high school that read all those magazines and don't eat because those people in those magazines don't look like that. Is that boosting their self-esteem? So, it goes on. Because people form bonds in their minds with their favorite celebrities, they are able to assimilate the celebrities' characteristics in themselves and feel better about themselves when they think of the celebrity, says Gabriel, one of the scientists that did this study. So, they're basically telling you, hey, look, if you worship a celebrity, you can take on their characteristics as part of yourself. This is what they've actually gone by. And they, they I think, had a thousand people that they followed around and studied this whole thing across America. This whole article is absolutely fascinating. I wish I could just read it all to you. There is a growing body of evidence that suggests that the human brain is not well equipped to distinguish between real relationships. As psychologists call them, parasocial or imagined ones. That means that some of the benefits people get from pseudo relationships with celebrities may be the same as those reaped from real relationships and real life interactions. It's okay to get caught up in the paralinear mania if her example makes you feel better about your chaotic life or of juggling work and family. As long as you realize that she won't be there to talk to you through your next family crisis. Hmm. Isn't it just like Satan to set up a system of false worship that when you go through a family crisis, you think they're going to help you? No. And since the beginning of time that Satan and his angels have gotten man to worship stupid little wooden idols, all of a sudden now he says, you know what's better than a wooden idol? Let's make those wooden idols into people. People make a lot better gods than wooden idols do. And so this idea of worshiping something other than God has just now changed and they've attached it onto people. Michael Jackson. The media attention for Michael Jackson's funeral tops the Pope, a president, and a princess. The Pope that he's talking about is Pope John that just died. The president that he's talking about is Ronald Reagan. And the princess is Princess Diana. More people read and heard and seen about this than all of those. Isn't that amazing? I find that amazing. I was at the post office the other day when Michael Jackson's funeral was on, and there was a woman behind me that was just 
on the phone with her husband at home going, tell me, is it an open casket? What's going on? Who's there? Who's this? And I'm just listening to this woman like go through a play-by-play -play action of what's going on. And she probably has never, ever met them in my life. It was absolutely fascinating. So I took a picture of Tom and Brandon today at the superstore or supermarket. All these Michael Jackson um, covers of all the magazines. Just go through the grocery store and look it on the line. And you can start to see, man, he was highly worshipped. Even though he had issues with child molestation and all these other things, now they've immortalized the guy. How is it that these actors and actresses are so electrifying? How is it that they gain such a grip on you? You ever sat and thought and wondered that? How are so many of Hollywood's most famous actors and actresses able to be so amazingly effective and convincing in their performances? That guy was so electrifying that it came through the television. How is it that they can move us to laughter, tears, or anger at the drop of a hat? Are they truly gifted with natural talent, as many suggest? You see this and you just, you're dazzled by their talent. Do they possess a creative streak of genius that is unknown to most men? Or unknown to most men, are they in fact possessed? Is it possible that these actors and actresses are possessed by demonic spirits who have a specific agenda to fulfill? Oscar award-winning actor Denzel Washington told 60 Minutes exactly how he brings forth his best performances. Basically what I did was got on my knees and sort of communicated with the spirits and when I came out, I was in charge. Powerful scene. Powerful scene. It, it was, I couldn't have acted that. I couldn't have written that down and made a decision to play that. What, are you going to smoke that? Nope. You are. <laughs> Hell if I am. Yeah. You're Jesus free. You're Jesus free. The one-woman entertainment empire known as Oprah has strong affiliations with the demonic realm. The most familiar face on television says, You can not only use your body and physical self. This is how I see acting. I ask my body to be the carrier for the spirits of those who have come before me in a way that is most meaningful to the character. Just become the vehicle for that character. Calling out for these entities to take her over so that she may become a sparkling puppet, Oprah admits of her work before the camera. I tried to empty myself and let the spirit inhabit me. With her global influence, her shows have become a smorgasbord for the New Age agenda. A lot of actors um, who don't mention their names, of course, are very much into this. Magic only exists if you allow it, if you open yourself up to the possibility. And here, like Denzel Washington says, wow, I got down on my hands and knees and I prayed to the spirit and when I got up, I was in charge. I couldn't have written that down. When I took acting classes, they taught me, you need to live, breathe, eat, sleep, acting, and you become that character, you invite that character into you. This is a very, very interesting world that these actors and actresses have, have involved themselves into. There is a man named Aleister Crowley. He is known as the most evil man of the 20th century. If you peel back the layers of most music and movies, he is hugely influential into writers and actors, and he was highly involved into the occult. He was known as like this horrible, like satanic priest. Um, the BBC did a wonderful documentary on this guy, if you ever want to see it, and it's not a Christian perspective. They called it the most evil man, and it's, you can watch it on YouTube. It's absolutely phenomenal what this guy was into. He wrote a book called Magic and Practice and Theory, where he outlined one of the best ways to become possessed by a demonic spirit. There are three main methods for invoking any deity. The third method is the dramatic, perhaps the most attractive of all. Certainly it is to so to the artist's temperament, for it appeals to his imagination through his aesthetic sense. So he's saying if you want to become possessed, acting is a great way to possess yourself with a different spirit, is what he's saying. Here's what Socrates has to say on acting. In like manner, the muse, first of all, inspires men herself. The muse is the, 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 the spirit, if you will, that inspires you to be an actor. Because they are inspired and possessed. They are simply inspired to utter that which the muse impels them. For not by art or by knowledge do you say what you say, but by possession. Now, I find what he has to say actually has in a sense, a weird sense, 
a lot of spiritual truth to it. Think back on the time that Christ cast out the, de the demon. And what did the demon do? He went away from the house, and he came back to check on the house, and when he found that it was completely clean and in order, but nobody was home, he went out and he grabbed seven more unclean spirits and came in and possessed his house. Right? So, thinking along those lines, is it possible that you are either possessed by the Spirit of God or by the Spirit of Satan? Is it possible, looking at it from a biblical perspective, that if you're not possessed by God, you can have an unclean spirit come into you and bring seven demons, and they're not knocking on your door asking if they can come in? So let's go through a little bit of movie history here. I'm going to bring you back, way back to the 1920s here, with Rudolph Valentino. Everybody, anybody heard of this guy? Yeah, he was, this guy was so famous. This guy was the Brad Pitt of his day. Women flocked to this guy. He was this passionate guy that all of his movies were about getting the girl and making out with them. And, and he was so famous that wherever he went, there was huge crowds that would gather. They actually had to have police follow the guy around. And it was said that if, when he would smoke his cigarettes and throw them on the ground, people would dogpile the cigarettes and try to pick them up and bring them home and have a little shrine with them or something. This guy was hugely worshipped, okay? Most of his movies came from his wife here, Natasha. They would actually write together. And this is a, a, uh, coming from a, a book that is all written about Natasha, his wife. Every night, Valentino's wife, Natasha, would hold a seance, calling forth help from the spirit world in her creative undertaking. And then with pencil and paper in hand, she would go into a trance and start writing. It's called automated writing in the occult world. After her outpourings were typed up, they were brought to the set the very next day and given to the director. And this is actually what they would make. So if you watched Valentino's movies, this is where they're coming from. She would have these seances, get possessed, write, and then she'd go give them to the director. Almost overnight, you see, America was built on very deep religious moral values. Overnight, what was considered sinful, sex outside of a marriage, was now starting to be redefined as popular, trendy, and even, like, uh, uh, exciting. Then Mae West hits the scene. And once again, America is still very deep into religious morality. So here's what, Mer or here's what Mae West has to contribute. In the 1930s, motion pictures were one of the mainstays of the Great Depression, and attendance to movie theaters skyrocketed. Hello, folks. I'm Mr. Brockner at uh, Mr. Grauman's Beautiful Theater to see the uh, grand opening of premiere of my new picture. I'm no angel. Of course, I didn't call it I'm no angel for nothing. <laughs> Don't forget, come up and see me sometime. Movie star Mae West was also known as the Queen of Sex and the Statue of Libido. Her work helped to topple the biblical sexual boundaries that were deeply embedded in the people of the early 20th century. She can have a romance with somebody outside of wedlock. I've got another man in my life. It was pretty raw. I don't know how many that makes. It was pretty raunchy for that era. Well, when I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. No star had greater impact in the long run than Mae West. Mae West was a one-woman sexual revolution. A one-woman sexual revolution was what she got stamped with. This one woman started to completely change the way that Americans were starting to view sex and their relationship with, between a man and a woman. She was hugely involved into the occult world. Her psychic, Kenny Kingston, reflects on her life and, and in a, in a uh, documentary that Kenny Kingston openly admits when she was upset and had no one been able to come up with a script idea, she walked about her room saying, forces, forces, please come and help me write a script. She would begin to hear voices and images and as the plot was revealed to her once again, automated writing. May would summon stenographers to work with her around the clock, and she would lie in bed in a trance-like state, dictating as the spirits entered her. 
And if you really think about Mae West's movies, it doesn't take very much stretch to understand. I'm no angel. The sensational Mae West. You know, these are obviously speaking of biblical things, but starting to break them down. Marilyn Monroe hits the scene a little bit later. Once again, pushing those boundaries farther and farther down the road of what we, what, how we view sex and the relationships. And here's what Marilyn has to contribute. Seven-year itch blew the lid off 1950s conservatism. Hey, wait a minute! It shocked audiences with its irreverent look at marital infidelity. I mean, I wouldn't be lying on the floor in the middle of the night in some man's apartment drinking champagne if he wasn't married and showcased Marilyn Monroe in her most sexually suggestive role to date. Let me just go put something on. I'll go into the kitchen and get dressed. The kitchen? Yes, when it's hot like this, you know what I do? I keep my undies in the icebox. She was the sexual icon of her particular time and became, I think, the sex star of the century. She could make you do anything in the world from that big screen. That what has Marilyn Monroe got that a million other women have and prefer not to show? Well, that's pretty vulgar if you ask me. I have a message for your wife. You can see those early signs of changing values. I'd like to stay here with you tonight. I'd like to sleep here. I think it's very nice, but I'd rather it for me. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very nice. Some girl. Monroe attributed her ability to affect the public to other entities that would inhabit her and take her over. She was known for entering into deep trances before each scene. One of Monroe's close personal psychics recalled how she would draw attention from the spirit world, asking for their guidance. When she saw a camera, any camera, she lit up and was totally different. The moment the shot was over, she fell back into her not very interesting position and I don't know how to explain that isn't it interesting that Mr. Hugh Hefner filthy Mr. Hugh Hefner himself says look at her she's starting to unlock the morals and 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 values <laughs> the value system you are starting to see a trend here and you're starting to see how they're just unlocking one step farther one step farther these sexual boundaries and if you look at where our movies are today, it doesn't take a very hard look at it to, to go, wow. I mean, these movies were just child's play compared to what we have now. Here's what she says. In a, in a, um, she was quoted saying, Jacqueline Hyde, more than two. I'm so many people sometimes they shock me. I wish it was just me. And if you've seen any documentaries of her, she had lived a tortured life, constantly just hearing voices in her head and things like that. And if you look at some of her movies, it doesn't take very much dedicated to the new Monroe Doctrine. Don't bother to knock a wicked sensation of the girl in room 809. What are the, where are these movie ideas coming from? What are these channels telling these actors and actresses to get involved in? And if you look at today, Original Sin, I mean, these movies are just commonplace. Zack and Miri make a porno. Even though that's like a funny movie, I mean, look at the content that they're making. Sex Drive. This is all about losing your virginity. And right here it says he's leaving virgin territory. Of course, throwing it away. Why? Why are they attacking our sexuality? Does anybody want to answer that? I'll tell you why. Because your sexuality and your spirituality are very much so intertwined. If they mess up your sexuality, chances are they're messing up your spirituality. Christ was constantly referring to the church as his bride, as a relationship between us, because that relationship is how we understand. The relationship of between a man and a woman is how you understand the love of God between us. And so if Satan can mess that love up, and all of a sudden now you cannot understand what human love is like, how are you to ever understand what the love of God is like? American Pie, 
was a popular, popular movie when I was in, in, in high school. I'm sure even some of the young kids in this room have never even heard of this movie. But it was all about losing your virginity and how, like, you know, you just needed to get rid of it as fast as possible. And, of course, the little caption at the bottom says there's something about your first piece. Now, here is a news clip of the news people going around and asking some kids that, that went to the theater and saw this movie and are going to talk about what their favorite part is. History that Hollywood peddles adult material to children. Now let's see how the spoon-fed material has affected them. You've heard one insider describe how the Hollywood machine marketed his R-rated movie to an audience too young to go see it. What movie did you see? American Pie. I saw American Pie. American, American Pie, Pie too. American Pie. American Pie. I'm 15. 14, 15, 13, 12, 12, 13. Who wants me to touch Amber? Oh, yeah! I love lesbians. They're great. Two girls are lesbians. The lesbian scene. Lesbian. 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 <laughs> That's hilarious. How aware are children of the corrosive influences? And they seem to pick up everything like sponges. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like Play-Doh. Put a piece of Play-Doh on a table and it picks up everything. Kids are Play-Doh. They don't even know what they've picked up. Parents out there. 12 and 13 years old, do you think that they honestly understand what sexuality is and what it was meant for and what the biblical boundaries of it are and what happens when you start to unlock those things and take those out? These poor children have no chance, no chance, and they're being targeted. I guarantee you these types of movies are not aimed at 30-something. Look at what they're aimed at. And this is just one example. This is just one genre of, of, of films. But you can start to understand that, listen, if you are not in the Word of God reading about these things and teaching your children or teaching those kids about what is sexuality and things like this, I guarantee you they're learning a lot from these types of movies. What lesbians are and what not, what have you. I Love Lucy. What could possibly be wrong with I Love Lucy? I love this show. Loved. I should say loved. I watched every single episode. My brother and I, we used to like sit down and watch these. I still chuckle when I see this. But I want to show you something that they're doing in a very subtle and slight way. Remember, Satan's got time. He has time on his hands to simply unlock our moral values, and he can do it very slowly. We don't have the time. He's got the time. Do you remember what one of her most infamous lines was? Hey, I'll tell him the truth. Don't you dare! What was she constantly telling him to do, to her to do? To lie. And the show was all about a manipulative woman that constantly lied to her friends and families and everybody else around them. In all wrapped in laughter. So you watch these kind of things, your guard goes down, and what's, what's a little white lie? Remember, during this time, this may not be detrimental to you, but you unlock that generation, then you unlock one more generation, and you keep going until we are today. Now we have movies that are all about lying and all sorts of things. At this time, Lucille Ball was a very famous big screen actress. It was known as career suicide to go to the little screen. And, and Lucille Ball actually chose to go to the little screen because of this actress, Carol Lombard, okay? Carol Lombard, it was the spirit of actress Carol Lombard who guided Lucille Ball into taking a chance on television and accepting the offer to star in I Love Lucy. The glamorous comedian who had died in an airplane crash of 1942 appeared to Lucy in 1951. And what do we know about the state of the dead? So if, if spirits are appearing to her and telling her, hey, you should pick this, you got to start to wonder. Because Lucille Ball accepted the spirits urging to take a chance, honey, she made television history. The Pink Panther. Peter Sellers was an was an out-of-work actor, completely could not book a part for his life, and then he started messing around with the spirit world. Peter was absolutely brilliant on the first take. Peter Sellers was a struggling actor whose career was on the rocks until he embraced demonic power. After selling his soul, he became the highest paid actor in Hollywood. 
The second take, he was even better. With three new Pink Panther adventures, all of which attained colossal box office success. Sellers, the has-been, was once again one of the world's highest paid performers. And listen, Fairy, do you sell beer here too? Among other things, yes. So here's what Peter Sellers has to say about acting. It's rather like being a medium and laying yourself wide open and saying, I want a character to inhabit my body or I want a spirit to take charge of me so that I can produce what I hope to produce. He was very much so open about his invoking spirits into his life and, and, and helping him. In fact, there's a whole documentary that's made. He was a very disturbed man. And, and um, it's quite a fascinating uh, documentary. Robin Williams came out in Us Weekly magazine and somebody asked him, how are you such a brilliant actor? Here's what he answers. Yeah, literally, it's like possession. All of a sudden, you're in. And you get all this energy, and it just starts going. But there's also that thing. It is possession. In the olden days, you'd be burned for it. But there is something empowering about it. I mean, it's a place where you are totally. It is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where you can really become this other force. That's an interesting thing to come out and say out into the open. Keanu Reeves is a very complex guy with lots of demons in him. I was trying to tap into him and utilize that, says director Taylor Hackford from The Devil's Advocate. Here's what director Anisco Holland of Totally Clips says about Leonardo DiCaprio. Leo is like a medium. He opens his body and his mind to receive messages coming from another person's life. Here's what a completely different director says about him, director Baz Luhrmann from Romeo and Juliet. With Leo, you might see 30 people come out of him in a day. Here's what Johnny Depp tells Us Magazine. I know I have demons. I'm 30 different people sometimes. And in fact, I just found this in, in the Los Angeles Times. Heath's creepy performance seems to have summoned up demons that no one thought have imaginable uh, or accessible to him. Imagine that they were accessible to him. So here, I mean, Los Angeles Times, not even saying anything about religion and everything. It's just saying, man, we didn't even think somebody could drum up those kind of demons. It's an interesting statement. And also, I love the script. I love the whole idea of um, selling your soul to the devil. Um, I'm kind of like, it's very intriguing to me. Do you think that they consider the words that come out of their mouths? I mean, is this a joke? Are we here on this planet as a joke? Do you think that God is looking down on us going, oh man, they're just playing things where they, you know, go out and sell their soul to the devil, but it's just a movie, just make belief. This is very real to them. And yet, these actors and actresses just act like this is an everyday thing. The Watchmen was, was, uh, just came out. It was a very popular movie with the younger people. Anybody heard of this movie, Watchmen? Any superheroes? These are all superhero comic books. There's a guy named Alan, uh, Alan Moore, who is a very famous comic book writer from England. Okay? He just came out with this movie, The Watchmen. Most of his movies are hugely Gnostic, occultic, like very weird, strange things about them and everything. He's written a Superman here. He wrote a movie called Extre uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen where um, Sean Connery played in that movie. Swamp Thing, From Hell, that was a Johnny Depp movie. V for Vendetta, that was a popular film that just came out not too long ago. Well, anyway, here is a, uh, a clip of... Alan Moore talking about he is very open with his worshiping of demons. And in fact, he said that his demons is what actually propelled his career. And he follows this god called Glycon. And he'll tell you all about it. Alan Moore is a writer and magician from Northampton. He's a stranger to hairdressers and worships his very own god in his very own way, blurring the lines between religious belief, magic, and the power of the creative imagination. Alan's familiar on his journey of faith and worship is an ancient Roman glove puppet snake called Glycon. So how did you first go about um, worshipping Glycon and what, what form does the worship take? Well, yeah. it's, it's irresistible. He's certainly the coolest, most rock and roll looking god that I have ever seen. I, yeah. I just fell in love at first sight. What's in it for you though, following Glycon? 
I believe that every single individual human being should probably make their own peace with the universe. I mean, we're all of us different emotionally, we're all different physically, intellectually. It would be really odd if we were all the same spiritually. So, I mean, that's why I have a problem with religion per se, because religion, the very word, it comes from the same root word as ligature and ligament, and it means to be bound together in one belief, which right. I find a bit creepy and a bit unnatural. You can't have that conversation with a Christian fundamentalist. I it, mean, it, it, religious fundamentalism, I mean, it's a bit of a misnomer, because if you actually look back at the foundations of Christianity, you find that the thinking is a lot more flexible. Yeah. The kind of what we call fundamentalism these days is basically entirely based upon 1930s tent show revivalism. Right. It goes back no further than about 80 years. And yet it's a very frightening and dangerous mindset because, I mean, as far as I understand it, at the moment there are genuine worries that, um, it, certainly in America, that this could actually negate science, yeah, that right. it could drag us back into a new dark ages. Here... He is saying religion is possibly going to negate science. And I just showed you an article in the beginning of this, a scientific article about worshipping celebrities. So, if that's kind of where science is leading me, I don't know about that. I would rather trust in this science, in God. And, you know, as... For those of you that were here in the first couple of days that Tom showed you exactly what is going on inside your brain, as you are sitting there staring at a blinking light source, you realize you are in your optimum amount of suggestibility. They know this, they've done studies on this, they can scientifically prove to you that they can tell you things in this dark room and you will actually soak them in and believe them and walk away with that. I mean, even that scientific article was saying, look, if you worship celebrities, you take on their characteristics. So here, somebody who actually believes that religion and 1930s tent revivalism where they're baptizing people is dangerous, do you really want to sit in a dark room and open up your mind to this person's thoughts? He, when he talked about invoking these spirits that helped his career, this is what he said, I decided that I was going to be a magician, and all of a sudden a lightning bolt hit. It got a bit strange, and for months after that I was looking back probably in some sort of borderline schizophrenic state. I found myself seemingly in conversation with an entity, its presence that surrounded my head and moving and speaking lucidly to me. I was very spaced out, God-struck. You know, you babble for a while like an idiot, but I must have been unbearable for about two or three months. I've integrated that into the rest of my life. He integrates spirit invoking into the rest of his work and in the rest of his life. So the point that I'm trying to bring out with this is you as a viewer, you only see the surface area. You don't see what actually goes on behind this. Who are these people? What are their actual beliefs? If you are going to watch these, which I hope after these presentations you will take a serious look at this and decide that you don't want to watch any of these, but know who you're watching. Know what they believe. Because it, like every piece of art, the art is meant to change you. That's what art is. It's to change the viewer. Anton LaVey, the guy that started the Church of Satan, actually built the Church of Satan off of the writings of Aleister Crowley. Won't go into all that, but Anton LaVey was the tippy-top guy of the Church of Satan, okay? This is what he says about the television. The television is the mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion. The TV set, or satanic family altar, as this guy likes to call it, has grown more elaborate since the early 50s, from tiny fuzzy little screens into huge entertainment centers covering entire walls with several monitors. What started as an innocent respite from everyday life has now become in itself a replacement for real life for millions, a major religion of the masses. This is coming from the Church of Satan. So if he's openly admitting that this is a major religion of the masses, we as Christians, or even people that 
maybe are, are, are out there that are contemplating all these things for, for a reason uh, or, or, you know, wondering about all these things, know that the dark side is openly admitting this thing is this thing. We designed it. This is part of the satanic new infiltration. And, we, and so many of us, every single person, 99% of people have a TV in their home. They can beam their thoughts into your home 24-7. And what kinds of things are coming out of the television? Dun, 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 dun. Well, I come from six feet under with a dead guy on my knee. I'm heading down to Hades for to spend eternity. Even worse than you thought. Well, what kind of crowd? He's not doing drugs, is he? No, no. <laughs> He's going to church. Oh, God, no. Who are you? I'm God. I am God. I am God. I am I God. God. If you listen. God's plan. God's plan? Yeah. All right, let me tell you about your God's plan. There is no God. There is no God. God is in the right. You have died for nothing. Who are you carrying all those bricks for anyway? God? Is that it? God? Well, I tell you. Let me give you a little inside information about God. He's an absentee landlord. Worship that never. Can I ask a question? Did you notice the checkered floor? Did you notice the altar? If you start to look at the sets, you start to see how this is way beyond what we even know. We're scratching the surface. This goes so much deeper than what we can even show you. And, it, you know, just to sit here and point out, look at all these things, look at all these things. Why are they doing this? The devil is doing his best to mess with who we are worshiping. That's what this is all about. Are we following God? Are we following Christ? Or are we following what the world tells you? So many people are focused on Michael Jackson. What about these things of, of, of God in eternity that we are struggling with right now? And if you really look at it, what is the Bible trying to teach you to do? What is this thing designed to do? Is it telling you to go out and kill a bunch of people? Is it telling you to cheat on your wife? Is it telling you to do all these horrible, evil things that are daily being pumped at us? So I just ask and pray that you guys, when you go home this weekend, really think about what is true worship? And is it possible to have both feet in both sides of the fence? Can you worship things of the earth and still reserve worship for God? If you really want to know what happens when you do that, study the Israelites coming out of Egypt. We are on the edge of the promised land. What they went through is exactly what we are going through right now. We are in Egypt. We are in Babylon. We're standing on the edge of this promised land, just as they were. And Satan is trying to send his, his evil influences and his women and all of his people just so that we would witness how they worship and how they party and all of a sudden, we would fall prey, just like the Israelites fell prey at the River Jordan. So, let's say a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your amazing love. Thank you that you have always been there for us. And um, I just praise your name for sending your son to die on our cross and to die our death in the the, the amazing opportunity that you've given us to be called the sons of God. Love you. Amen. Mm -hmm.